I would now like to welcome Dr. Musimbi Kanyoro of the Global Fund for Women. Dr. Kanyoro is globally recognized for her leadership of organizations and initiatives that advance health, development, human rights, and philanthropy for communities, specifically for women and children, for women and girls, which includes children. It's an honor to have her here with us tonight, so please welcome Dr. Kanyoro. You can come around here. Thank you very much. I hope you are enjoying your dinner as I did mine. Bon appetit. Good. Oh. See what happens when you are, have enjoyed a good dinner. So I am really very, very delighted that you welcomed me to be with you this evening. Um, I am a recovering news addict. Recovering because I have now to realize that there's a lot of false news, so I should be much more selective. When I was growing up in Kenya, which is my home country, part of what we were trained for leadership was that you do need to keep in touch with news, but not one channel. You have to listen to many different types of news so that you can actually make up your mind what is happening in the world and I don't know if there's a difference today. So I have been asked to speak about why gender lens is important in reporting. And my objective tonight is that at the end of my few minutes, that I would be able to convince you to join me in actually believing and committing yourself to gender lens reporting because it's very important, just believe me, it's very important. So as you've heard, I am the President and CEO of the Global Fund for Women, but in addition to this, I am in my personal life a philanthropist and work currently in the area of philanthropy. I'm also, for a very long time, for as long as I remember myself, a champion of women's rights and a feminist activist. Yeah. Although, <laughs> although I have not planned to make all of you feminist activists, <laughs> I have to tell you that I have the aspirations. So how do I make you comfortable with understanding gender lens? Let me first make sure that we, we are on the same page. When I think of gender lens, I literally think of lenses, you know, glasses. I have been wearing glasses since I was the age of three. Thank goodness for lenses. <laughs> Whenever I remove them, I don't see the world properly. So as someone who has worn glasses for the whole of my life, I know that lens helped me to see the world the way it really is, properly. So when we talk about using gender as a lens, we're not talking about putting a bias on your story, but rather improving the way that you see the world so that you can see the reality of how the world looks like. It's about understanding that men and women are impacted differently by, by anything, by poverty, by war, by anything. And we have data, we have research that shows that there is different impact between men and women. And so we are saying in any kind of reporting, any kind of news, we need to ask the right questions. How, how are men impacted? How are women impacted? How are children, boys and girls impacted? and be able to take note and utilize the information that we have learned. So how do I know that media coverage today could do better using gender lens? First, I know just by the coverage all around me. Just by picking any paper in the morning or turning on the TV helps me to understand how much more we need to do in this area. 
we have not arrived there yet. And being a world traveler, I have been a world traveler for the 30 years that I have worked internationally in many, many different countries. There are places where media coverage is frankly sinful in the way that it treats women and children. Extremely sinful because they are not treated as people at all if they are at all noticed. Secondly, there's hard evidence from many sources. I'm part of a project called Global Media Mon Monitoring Project, which is led by a Canadian-based social justice group, the World Association for Christian Communication. In its most recent report, they looked at media coverage in 15 countries undergoing conflict, including the Congo, Guatemala, Afghanistan, etc. Their analysis included 867 stories on peace and security published in 83 major media outlets and reported by 347 different journalists who have nothing in common with each other. Here are some of the key findings. Women are barely present in peace and security news produced in transnational and conflict countries. They constituted for the study period only 13% of the persons seen, interviewed, or spoken about. 20% of the women are, were portrayed, in 20% of the reporting, women were portrayed as victims in contrast, say, to 7% of men. And this means they are seen as powerless to solving their own problems or even to understanding what is going on around them. The gender of the reporter in this study made a lot of difference. Where there were women reporters or female reporters, they reported more on the female in, and had more females in their interviews. And finally, stories by women reporters were five times more likely than those that of the male reporters to highlight issues of gender inequality or gender equality. From being here in the afternoon and listening to the uh, seminars, seminars that we've had, I could really verify this because a number of women who reported talked about how they were trusted in the communities where they went by women so that women were able to tell them their stories. So what does this really tell us? We know that media coverage of women shows some bias, but what can we do about it? There are some important steps that media and reporters in this room can take. So I just suggest three. One, I think we can all work towards ensuring that there are more women in journalism. That's a gender lens way of looking at journalism. And I'm not just talking about the United States because when I looked at the statistics in the United States, you're not doing too badly in terms of women in journalism. But you are not about the United States alone. You're not even about the United States first because many of the reporters here report from the world outside the United States. So I think we need to be thinking to, together, collectively, how we can be able to get more women in the area of journalism. Secondly, I think each reporter here should commit to examining and challenging your own gender biases and to ensure that you are applying a gender lens in your reporting without feeling that you are betraying something, without feeling guilty about it. It's not about leaving the males out. It's not about leaving civil society out, but it's acknowledging that there are differences in the way that sexes are impacted by the context in which they live. And each media outlet should commit to examining the scope of reporting, what each media outlet did, uh, what if each media outlet did just what this study did, and what I heard that uh, National Geographic is doing by analyzing their stories from a media, from a, a gender lens perspective. I think this will help each media outlet 
to try to see if they are on the right track or not. So what does this mean in practical terms? I want to share three ideas you may wish to remember every time you write a story or take a photograph or begin to develop a pitch or a proposal for funding. One, ask yourself, is there a way you can bring in a women's perspective? Tell her story, use her quotes, or use her as the expert lens through which to tell the story. Secondly, apply a gender lens test to your story. This can be as simple as a word choice, swapping a word such as victim to survivor, but it carries a great lot of difference. And three, stop idealizing women's stories of resilience. It's very clear that whenever a story of one woman resilient or successful is taken, it's sometimes over-idealized that other women who are doing the same are not seen. Women are resilient most of the time. Because if you... <laughs> So again, if every media person took all of these steps, we would begin to see coverage that is more fair and accurate. I told you at the beginning that I was not trying to make you feminists, all feminist activists. That was fake news. <laughs> so, I, at the Global Fund for Women Where I Work, we are firmly committed to being just that, really feminist activists and I must make some of you feminist activists. So what do we do at the Global Fund for Women? First, we believe in a vision that every woman and girl is strong, safe, powerful, and no exception. So how do we work towards that vision? What does it take? One, it takes really trusting that women are people and they are able to determine their own lives. So what we do actually is that we find and fund and amplify the courageous work of women who are building social movements and challenging the status quo. We have invested in more than 500 grassroots women's groups in 175 countries. We are in philanthropy and we have found that when you give money to, in a neutral way, when you give it, in quotes, in a neutral way, to either refugees or to a health thing or to reduce poverty, you are not effective in responding to the actual needs to those communities in need. We found that out, that you really have to go beyond just giving it. I'll give it in a neutral way and then everybody will just benefit by what drops in their hands. You have to use a gender lens to see who is benefiting and who is missing out. We found that in practice, women and girls are often the ones missing. So our grant making is designed to get directly into the hands of women. What does that actually look like on the ground? I stated out about how women in conflict zones are missing from the media coverage or portrayed solely as victims. But in our work, we actually find that women in the situations of need such as conflicts are very resourceful. I recently traveled to Colombia and I visited a group of women not too far from Cartagena who had some years back uh, been affected by the, uh, the, co the conflict in, in um, Colombia. And they decided that they, want, they, they, did not, they, they were not in a safe place. And they applied to the Global Fund for support and bought land and build a place and build actually a women's city. Not a place where only women live, but a place where they were able to find security and safety and have uh, help that they needed and be able to begin new lives with new families, with new husbands, with new children. And this place was part of the innovation that we saw in women. In Afghanistan, for example, the Global Fund funded for many before it was out in the presence of media like all of yourself, house education for girls. Because word had come to the Global Fund for Women through the women that 
the Global Fund had contact with before, saying the Taliban were not allowing girls to go to school. And so we were able to do that for a long time. Now, so our grant making is a grant making that builds trust first when things are well. Because once you build that trust by making sure that the people that you are relating to know you, there is no higher investment that you can make in a people than building their trust. Because when trouble comes, when there is conflicts, when there are floods, when there are refugees, you continually get information and you get the right information. And so very often, we are always attached and ready to receive information in places of disaster and in places of conflict because we have our eyes on the ground. Another area that was very important for us is that the Global Fund began already three decades ago to understand that people with different sexualities in different contexts are treated badly. And so we invested in the funding of LGBTQI before we got the kind of freedoms that we have today long enough. And believe me, in every country that you can think of, we do have information about what is happening to LGBTQI because we trust them and they trust us. It's the kind of grant making that we do. It's the kind of grant making that we do that this biases people. Um, one, I would like to conclude by saying where I get dissatisfied with media. I get dissatisfied with media because of the copycat behavior. Why is it that today, when we think about the, the refugee situation, we each copycat the Syrian refugee, and then we copycat the effect in Europe at the Global Fund, we have focused what is happening to the refugees who stay in Middle East. And if you want the story for us, we would say we want to lift up what is happening with refugees who are in Turkey, who are in Jordan, who are in Lebanon, who are in the places that is neighboring. Because if you compare the number of refugees who come to Europe and those who stay in the Middle Eastern countries, you will see the imbalance. But media copycats that refugees have come to Europe, therefore Europe is threatened, therefore America is threatened, and that's what gets covered. I think that is not justice. The second aspect of it, coming from Kenya myself, it's incredible how I hear now about refugee camps. I come from a country that has had refugee camps for years. Believe me, I never had anybody cry as hard about refugee camps in my own country, except when they don't like what they see that is happening. So these are things that you can use gender lens or you can use other lenses for, for justice. So I want to conclude uh, by acknowledging the efforts that are being made by the Pulsar Center and to thank you for the leadership that you are providing in creating a new way of actually reporting. I have been impressed by what I've heard from the people on panels. I've been impressed by what I learned about this center in preparing to come here. And I've been impressed by the kind of scholarships and the new formation of the journalists that you are making into the future. And global journalism will, will change. The Irish journalist Margaret Gallagher once said, media are both powerful institutional and powerful defining mechanisms and are fundamental to the way in which women's status and gender inequalities are reflected, understood, and potentially engaged. I couldn't agree more, but I know if we are careful and really can wear the gender lens glasses, we will make the world better. Thank you. <laughs>